Nei rā te mihi atu ki a koutou i ui ui mai nei a i tēnei ata <coughs> te me tuatahi. Uh, hei karekia mō tātou, hei timata, uh, tēnei hui hui ngā hui taumata uh, mō te um, <coughs> patea kōwhi ore uh, me te mahi. Tihe mauri ora, tihe uri uri, tihe nako nako, kā tau hā whakatau ko rangi nui e tui ho nei, kā tau hā whakatau ko papatua nuku e tā ko toa ke nei, kā tau hā whakatau ko te mātuku mai rarotonga, ko i a rukuhia mano a pauroto, ko i a rukuhia mano a pauaho, ki a tīna whakatīna, te more i hawai ki e pūpū ano hoki, e wāwau ano hoki, Tārewa tū ki te rangi eke pānuku kia eke, eke tangaro taumai te mauri. Haumie, huie, tāie. E ngā mana e ngā reo e ngā kārangaranga o te mōsu. Mai te hiku o tika ki te tai rāwhiti, mai te tai rāwhiti ki te tai hauauru. Whakawhiti te moana o rau kawakawa, ki te waka a Maui, ki raki urā. Ki whare kauri e kui mā e kuru mā i te pō, moi mai, moi mai nga. Rātau rā kia kua whitu rangitea, mā te kaha tāwhiri mātea, ka tuku te mihi maumahara ki a rātau, me o rātau huarahi pākaru hainu wā, ka mihi atu ki ngā whānau. Ngā whānau pani, ngā whānau o te tai rāwhiti, o te tai toke rau a tāmaki makaurau, a pare hauraki, kei raro te pēhi tanga a tāwhiri mātea. Ka tuku te mihi atu ki a kotau e ui ui mai nei mō tēnei ata, mō tēnei rā, a hako nō whea, a hako kō wai, te me nui mō tātou, kei rotu i tēnei ao, he tāngata, he tāngata. He tāngata. A ka tuku atu te mihi ki a koe e Rob, ko te huki, ngā kaimahi, i awhi te kaupapa nei mō tātou, mō te haura ki te hāpori, ki te whānau, ki ngā iwi, puta noa o te motu o te ao. Huri noa, nō mātou nei te mana whenua o pōneke, o te whanganui ataro o te upoko o tika, ke te mihi atu ki a koe tau. Ka puta mai he koro wai aroha ki o koutou mō koutou tauaro ki ngā mahi whakahirihira mō tātou. Nō reira, tēnei te mihi atu ki a koutou. Ka mutu tēnei wahanga mā te karakea mō tēnei ata. Whakataka te hau ki te uru, whakataka te hau ki te tōnga. Ki a mā ki nga ki nga ki uta, ki a mā tara tara ki tai. E hiake ana te atakura, he tio, he huka, he hauhu, tihe, mauri ora. Ki a tau te rangi marie, ki o hohau te rongo, ki a kotahi ai tātou katoa, ai ake nei ai, ai. Tēnei te mihi atu ki a kotou. Kia ora, Rob. Just on behalf of the mana whenua, strangely here in Pōneke, when you are all everywhere else. Um, Any way we can bless Kairungi, Te Ipurangi, um, is a uh, tikanga well observed. So uh, I'd like to hand it over to you. Kia ora tata. Nā mihi, uh, uh, Toa, thank you very much indeed, and welcome to uh, a great effort here, and we're going to make a great effort to make this a very special day for you. So we're going to start session one, and I'll hand over now to Wendy McRae, who is going to chair this session. Thank you, Rob. Um, and I'm honoured, honestly, to be chairing this first session of what I hope is a wonderful symposium. So before I start, I just want to remind you that we have a panel discussion at the end. Um, so we're going to move through the presentations without any questions. Rob, our session facilitator, is going to collate any questions you put through on our Q&A and ask the most pertinent questions to our panel at the end. So in this first session, we want to acknowledge that the people with the lived experience of COVID, as well as researchers in that field, are the ones who are providing foundational narratives about the impact of COVID on people, 
on their whānau and in their work um, in whatever form that may take. So it gives me great pleasure to introduce our first speaker of the day, Hayley Walters. Hayley is a long COVID advocate um, with a lived experience of COVID. So her presentation is titled, um, is, is working um, with COVID, a lived experience. Tēnā koutou katoa. Ko Hayley Walters, Toka Ingoa. And I have lived experience of long COVID. Before I begin, I'd like to acknowledge that powerful introduction from Tor and to note that all of us are here today because we're responding to a need, whether it's a desire for knowledge, for tools, for advice, or lived experience to inform equitable policy. We're here because we're all in some way, shape or form, the people who can make change happen. This is something to have front of mind before we start today. I'd also like to say that many of us are here during a really challenging time, navigating the impact of the flood and the cyclone. Kia kaha and thank you for being here today. I'd also like to acknowledge that lived experience has been centred, not sidelined as part of the planning for today. Thank you to the organisers for being conscious of the knowledge and experience we bring to this forum and for structuring the agenda accordingly. If you told me at the beginning of 2020 that three years later, I'd be talking to a very large group of people about my experience having a big scary virus uh, that was making headlines around the world. At the same time, we spent locked in our houses while also watching celebrities sing John Lennon's Imagine to each other that would have been a very interesting thing for you to say. And yet here we are. I'm somebody who has lived experience of long COVID and I'm gonna talk about the experience of what that looks like and to tell you what that looks like while working. I'm coming back a little bit later today to tell you what it looks like to be a supportive employer courtesy of recommendations from long COVID support Aotearoa. I look forward to that conversation as well. I got sick in March 2020. Specifically, I began to get symptoms on the same day that Prime Minister Jacinda Ardern announced we were going into lockdown, which just as an aside, that exact time is the very worst time to start to get symptoms from a mystery virus that is sweeping the world. I don't recommend that approach. So with everyone suddenly locked in their houses, two days later at midnight, I was sitting wedged in a corner of my bed and I was trying desperately to breathe. I felt like I was sucking air through a straw. I felt like my lungs were filled with thousands of crawling ants and every ant was on fire. Every time that I lay down, I couldn't get enough air. I stayed awake that whole night because I thought that I would die if I lay down. I thought that I would die if I fell asleep. I didn't call an ambulance because I knew that there was something really wrong with me and I was absolutely terrified that if someone came into my house to try to help me, that I would pass this thing on to them. So I stayed upright and I stayed awake and I wrote a goodbye letter to my sister on the notes app of my phone because I wasn't sure that I would make it. That remains the worst night of my life and clearly I survived, but I didn't get better. So what was working like? Four months, I really struggled. Um, I was relapsing. Every time I tried to push through, I triggered a full-blown replay of my initial symptoms. This is very common for long COVID. I struggled to walk up a hill. Going for my usual run was completely out of the question, off the table. I had heart palpitations, chills that came and went, headaches and crushing. I will say that word again, crushing fatigue. No two experiences of COVID are the same. The effects of COVID are neurological, cardiovascular, immunological, systemic. It can hit every organ. Long COVID affects one in 10 people at a minimum. You might not know 
but two months plus is long COVID. Under two months can be ongoing post-viral symptoms. What I've just described can hit anyone recovering from COVID before it turns into long COVID. It is important that that is widely understood and important to keep in mind as we move through the day. I genuinely consider 18 months of debilitating symptoms to be lucky because long COVID is no joke. I am privileged to know many people three years later who are still battling every single day. For me, I consider myself 90% recovered with enough ongoing symptoms that a reinfection could compromise my health more than it already is. The greatest gift that I was given was that my boss, when I went to her and said, hey, I've read about this, this thing on Facebook and I think that I might have it, uh, which is an interesting conversation to have. She didn't kick me out of the building, but listened and we worked on a plan together. At the time, I was remote working by default, but it really helped to be able to take meetings in my pajamas. Uh, the camera was off. I was able to work at night. My sleeping patterns for months were out of whack. I was working at 3 a.m. some days because that is when I was awake. We all talk about meetings that could have been emails and how exhausting a back-to-back -back day can be. One, one meeting could exhaust me for the rest of the day. I was able to talk to my colleagues about structuring my time based on the symptoms I felt on the day, because as I said, no two days are the same, and I felt supported and not judged in doing that. Something that I still really struggle with is my great love, writing. I will often write down the word that I mean, but spell it incorrectly. I will write things like progress when I mean process. I try to double check everything, but it does make for interesting reading sometimes. This is a small example, but an important point. I lend no less value to the role that I have, but now that looks a little bit different and space was created for that to happen. The experience that I had being supported by my boss, her compassion, willingness to listen and adapt my work responsibilities to the situation, that will stay with me for the rest of my life. I also acknowledge that not everyone has the same type of job. I have the privilege of being able to work from my laptop. Policy needs to consider the entirety of different kinds of work. I also have the privilege of being able to advocate for myself. As a leader in my day job who manages people, I need to say clearly that there will be people we manage who need us to advocate for them. It should be noted that I have the privilege of having a supportive boss. It should be the case that a supportive boss is a bonus that is backed by policy. Because everyone has the right to be heard and supported with as much empathy and integrity as I experienced. That brings me to what next? Modelling suggests taking into account previous waves that over 400,000 people in Aotearoa have long COVID. At 400,000, there is an unequivocal, undeniable need for policy. I would confidently say that every single one of you has someone with long COVID in your workforce, as your colleague, as someone you work alongside. If you don't know anyone, it's not because you don't have anyone, it's that they don't trust you will support them or don't know how you will support them. We are yet to grapple with what COVID makes us now. Author Susanna Arandati Roy wrote that the pandemic is a portal. I firmly believe that we can't go back to Kansas and that what is required now is leadership. We need new ways of thinking. We do have a new reality now and the many amazing speakers today are going to undeniably, unequivocally demonstrate that. Thank you for stepping up and for acknowledging we are through that portal by your presence here today. We may be on the other side of the portal, but not the pandemic. You're well ahead of the inevitable curve by being in this room. 
Leadership requires vision and the acknowledgement that shifts need to happen based on data, evidence, reality. The long-term health of your workforce is a vision to hold and plan for now. Finally, to the people who have experienced long COVID who I know are in the audience today, I see you, I hear you, and I am so glad and grateful to know you. And I know that there are enough brilliant minds in the room today, your voices included, to create some meaningful change. Namahin yui kia koe. Thank you. And thank you, Hayley. That was a, a very powerful start and a very personal story. So we thank you for, for sharing it with us. Um, we're going to move on now, though, to our next speaker, um, who's a researcher, Mona Jeffries. Mona is a senior research fellow in the Health Service Research Centre, um, Victoria University in Wellington. Mona today is talking about long COVID and that inability to work. Over to you, Mona. Just checking that screen is sharing okay? Thank you. Tēnā koutou katoa, ke te heiranga waka ahau e mahi ana, ko Mona Jeffries tōku ingoa. Tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou katoa. I'd just like to begin by a, a huge uh, mihi to, to that very, very powerful um, start to the day. Uh, thank you, Hayley, for really setting the scene, for telling us what it's really like. And I think that we need to keep that inside our heads the whole way through the day and as we move forward taking away the learnings of today just to remember the um the huge impact that covid is having uh, on uh, on so many people right, sorry um so for those of you who don't know much about long covid Haley's given a, a beautiful start but i just thought i would start by saying a bit about what the symptoms of long COVID are. At the moment, there's 203 recognized symptoms of long COVID. Not everybody has all of those. Not everyone has all the symptoms they experience all at once. They fluctuate, they come and go in terms of presence and severity. But when we look at the data, and I'm presenting here data that were collected from 217 people in Aotearoa with long COVID, the most common symptom by far is fatigue. And when we say fatigue, this is not just, oh, I'm a bit tired. This is fatigue where suddenly I cannot function anymore and I have to stop and stop doing whatever I'm doing. It's overwhelming. If you haven't got a post-viral syndrome or other, have had other um, fatigue related symptoms, you're unlikely to know that just how huge this is. Another very important symptom that affects work is brain fog. And, and Haley alluded to that about not being able to find the right words, not being able to find your keys. But we've had stories of an electrician who gave up his work because he wasn't safe in his work. He knew he wasn't safe because of the brain fog. Huge amounts of pain are reported, joint pain, muscle pain, muscle weakness, headaches that can be really debilitating. So I just want you to remember that those are the symptoms that we're talking about that can have a huge influence on people's ability to work if they have got long COVID. We were very lucky in Aotearoa being a year and a half behind the, the wave of the, um, the, of the pandemic that swept the world. And so we've got some learnings from overseas that we can look at. And I've got here uh, just a few studies that have been done about um, the international literature on ability to work with long COVID. So all the data that are shown on this slide are the percentages are based on people who were working before they had COVID. So of those people in one international study uh, from Europe and North America, about a quarter were not working because of COVID and another half had to reduce their work hours because of long COVID. In a review of five studies, somewhere between a third and a half of people with long COVID were not able to return to work. And a study from the UK looking at um, uh, being able to put those in terms of the context of the proportion of the workforce, so, uh, nearly 4% of the workforce are thought not to be working at the moment in the UK because of having long COVID. So what does that look like when we translate it into local data? 
So in Aotearoa, the study, the results that we've got from the study, the impacts of, uh, of COVID uh, in Aotearoa, Nakawekawe or Mate Corona, we found that about one in five people still has, still has symptoms three months later. The, the most conservative estimate that we came up with is about one in 40 people who have got long COVID following a COVID infection. Now, nearly half those people have their usual activities moderately to severely affected. And that's what's shown in the two left hand bars on the graph there. And when we say usual activities, that includes work, also includes volunteering. It includes being a parent. It includes your normal social functioning. It might include exercise, might include um, all sorts of, of work that we that we do. So when I talk about work, we're not only focusing on paid employment. In Aotearoa at the moment, there's about one and a half million people aged 20 to 69 who have reported having had COVID-19. So that translates to about 150,000 people who have their usual activities moderately to severely affected. And using that most conservative estimate, we're talking uh, 20,000 people. But I say most conservative, that is a, a very, very low band so that we're, we're much more likely to be talking uh, in the, the hundreds of thousands of people. And as Hayley mentioned, it's probably not that you don't know someone who's got long COVID, it's just that you don't know that they've got it. Because I know from personal experience and for many other people, it's very easy to uh, only show your face when you're well enough to do that. And the times that you don't see people are the times that they are really struggling. So in our study, we found that among people with long COVID, about half had had time off work. Two thirds had ha of those had had more than 10 days off work. And when we think about that policy that was brought in to up paid sick leave, that only was up to 10 days of paid sick leave. So that's the, the statutory minimum. Many people are lucky to have employers who are more generous than that, but not everybody is. And one in five people have had more than three months off work. So we are talking really significant impacts on people's lives and livelihoods. As, as, alongside the survey, we also did some qualitative work. And I just have some quotes here of people who talked about how long COVID affected their work. I now have breathing problems, heart problems, fatigue, muscle and joint pains. These are bad enough that I had to give up my job as a health professional. And I've, I haven't said what sort of health professional she is. I haven't worked since August 2020. I had to stop going to the office. I started working from home full time and I'd fall asleep during the day sometimes. COVID caused me to give up my job and move out of my home in with my parents. Now I struggle to get out of bed in the morning. Exercise destroys me. My overall energy levels are so low, I can't get through a full day of work. And I'm afraid my manager will notice and I'll lose my job. It's left me debilitated. I had to resign from my part-time job in retail. I haven't been able to work since. I was unable to complete my final year of high school. Now you think for that last young woman, the trajectory of her life is completely changed. For somebody who couldn't finish high school and can no longer work when she's so young. So we're talking that the impacts here are really, really huge. Now, I know some of these symptoms of long COVID are going to be talked about later um, this afternoon, but just to highlight that post-exertional malaise is really important. So this is what Haley called, called a crash. This is where you do too much and you end up worsening your own symptoms. So the data that you can see here, the left-hand bar is for physical activity and the right-hand bar is for mental activity. If you do too much, your symptoms are much more likely to get worse. So the people in the dark blue are the people who said their symptoms got a lot worse than the people in the, the middling blue are those who said their symptoms got a little worse. Physical activity isn't running a marathon. For some people, it might be walking to the bathroom. For some people, it might be well, getting themselves to an office. For some people, it might be cooking their dinner. Mental activity isn't rocket science. It might be doing a crossword, it might be reading a page of a book, it might be writing a paragraph. So it can be really small, low levels of activity that can have huge impacts on people's ability to function. And those um, that functioning can be worsened over the next day or two days, or it might tip people into a much more significant crash in terms of weeks uh, of not being able to function at the level that they were functioning at prior. 
Mental distress is really a huge thing in, in long COVID and it is a consequence, not a cause of long COVID. That's really important to emphasize. And just thinking here about people who uh, experience long COVID or indeed are caregivers or parents of uh, children or teenagers with long COVID. Policies to keep people in work, return to work policies, supportive workplace, some of that was described beautifully by Haley. how important that is. The potential for income insurance, which clearly, unfortunately, is now off the cards uh, in terms of government funding at the moment. And the importance of peer support, so all those things can keep people able to work at a, maybe at a different level to what they were working before, but nevertheless can keep them in the workforce, can allow them potentially to get qualifications or to remain in school and create opportunities for that lifelong trajectory. Whereas those people who aren't lucky enough to have those support systems in place or to experience them through their workplace are going to struggle. And the level of mental distress that we saw in the study that we did was really high. So among people uh, who had long COVID, then somewhere between a third and a half of people were reporting anxiety. So the blue bar there for Tangata Whenua for Māori, the orange bar for Tangata Tiliti for non-Māori, and slightly lower but really significant uh, levels of depression as well. We've still got a huge number of unknowns. We don't really know how long this is going to last. We have some um, anecdotal evidence and we have some evidence from uh, ME research, so from research on chronic fatigue syndrome and other post-viral syndromes. But the reality is we don't really know what's gonna happen for long COVID. We don't know about the impact of, uh, of other strains. There's not enough evidence yet on Omicron in terms of the duration. And uh, we're going to, we don't know much about reinfection of which Amanda is going to speak about later on. So we're doing a lot of work on what works best to keep people in work. And hopefully today you're going to be have some takeaways from, uh, from the other speakers as well. So just in summary, long COVID is common and debilitating. And there's a lot that employers can do to make life a whole lot better for those people who are living with this debilitating disease. And I'd just like to acknowledge all those people who contributed to the study. I've just shown you some very brief results from our study. And just to let you know that the references that I commented on earlier are there on the last slide. And our full report from uh, the Nakawaikawe study is at the COVID Aotearoa website. And you can download it from there. Namahinui. Thank you, Mona. We are so grateful for the work you do and for really adding our Aotearoa voice to the international literature. Now I want to go on and introduce to you David Hood. Um, David's a data analyst who's been summarising publicly available data and trends about the current state of COVID in New Zealand. His presentation is titled, What We Know About Exposures and Spread from Public Data. David. Kia ora koutou katoa. Now, if I just need to hit one more button. There we go. In November 2022, I saw that an OIA response had information about broad occupational group infection rates to mid-August 2022. As over 98% of these cases were since mid-February, I think it's more useful to think of that as the percentage of the workforce reporting COVID in the first six months of Omicron, because we're in this for the long haul. And I also remembered that in 2020, Figure New Zealand um, did an assessment of job risks from COVID by linking StatsNZ occupational information to ONET job context information. ONET is an American pre-COVID survey of job attitude um, attributes, but it is useful here for generalities. I want to acknowledge Figure NZ's mahi in this, and I decided to repeat their work based on how many occupations got infected. So exploring the um, relationship between job attributes and infections, and all of the data is at the web link at the bottom of every slide. If you look at significant variables in the results, it's not a surprise that more contact with others leads to more infections, but it is a sliding scale. By the way, the orange line is people with no known occupation as a reference point. And while COVID fatalists may be focused on the lower part of the graph, that no occupation reported less than 17% of people um, infected, the upper half of the graph has the maximum at more than twice the minimum, 
And that variation is human behavior and human constructed environments and where the lowering of the rate of infection is easiest because it is about people and their interactions and environments. We can also compare different variables to each other. Each percentage of workers never working with groups lowers the risk faster than working in close contact raises it. Working outdoors reduces risk at about the same rate as close contact increases it. Read that as access to outdoor quality air. Um, common safety gear, um, use of common safety gear, shows the complications of working with public data not designed for the situation. It includes gloves and eye and ear protection that make not a lot of difference with COVID, but it also includes workplace environments that are hostile to casual crowding, and it includes work with formal understanding that occupational hazards exist and can be mitigated. Another approach is to say a given variable like close contact, if we cancel that out, what are other important variables? So if we take that line I showed in the earlier slide, face-to-face -face contact is still very important. So make those meetings emails. A lot of variables relating to environments hostile to other people are there, but also the more it is unimportant to be exact, the more COVID. Hold that thought. Um, as often making a case with data not designed for the question involves having a whole bunch of variables pointed the same way. You can also take the approach of checking the pattern across a related variable. ONET did actually ask a question about exposure to disease. The darker the shading I put in the slide, the less exposure pre-COVID to general diseases. Never being exposed to pre-COVID infections makes a job safer in the COVID area. But the second safest category is people exposed daily to pre-COVID infections. A group with infection is a constant occupational risk and formal exacting health and safety protective gear requirements fall into that group. So keeping in mind, we've already in, um, accounted for the degree of close contact there. We can also do nothing fancy mathematical and just compare the numbers from different occupational groups and speculate as to what might be learned from the differences. School teachers and tertiary teachers. Is it about contact time? Maybe. Maybe there is also about the strong 2022 push, um, not possible with school age students needing supervision to stay home if potentially infected and keep up to date with lectures via recordings. So that's just speculation, but it's the kind of questions you should be asking. What are these attributes that make a difference? To give a few more, insurance agents versus real estate agents. Now, certainly one of those occupational groups gets out in the fresh air a lot more as part of their job and does so by private transport. Once again, I don't know if that is the answer, but I think these are useful questions to be asking with this data that is now available to everyone. Hospitality versus workers versus sales assistants and salespeople. Once again, a different in exposures that I would speculate the difference is the density of patrons in the work area. And differences between managers and the people they manage. So that might prompt some thoughts about which managers in some occupations share the same environments, which work in a private office versus their staff being in a more shared space. Now, I also want to talk a bit about current spread and potential lessons for workplaces. So as a baseline, in late 2022, there was a cruise ship tour from Australia that did a 12-day tour of New Zealand. And that extended high exposure environment saw cases increasing at a daily average doubling of about 18 hours over the 12 days. So every 18 hours, the, the cases doubled on average. 
And then we have Tairafiti in the New Year's period in orange and every other DHB as black lines. And this is the percentage of the DHB population reporting new infections. What we've got there is a three day music festival where on average, the number of expected infectious participants infected on average about four other people. And that's the start of that graph. And then it goes up rapidly as people disperse to their homes and workplaces in extended shared ear, indoor ear, without being on guard. But then something really important happens on January 6th. Cases stop going up. They start coming down. So that was after the generation of that close contact exposures. People were a bit more on guard about COVID. And while it still spread within spaces with extended con contact, it was not really as successful enough at making casual contact jumps to keep increasing. So given current mitigations, resistance and COVID variables, it doesn't take much to end an outbreak um, because that change wasn't running out of people who could be infected if they were in a high exposure context and it wasn't dramatic coercive action. And for a workplace, what that lesson is you could get a whole lot of people coming down at the same time in shared workplaces if you aren't a bit on guard. But if you are a bit on guard, you've got a good chance of catching it and getting much better business continuity and fewer staff infected. So these days, we're in a cycle of repeat risk of infections. I personally know people have been infected three or four times. Um, but the frequency of those risks is something that there's space to make a difference with. Maybe not for every infection everywhere for all time, but still slowing those rates and decreasing the cumulative number of infections. So, I put together this data about occupations and spread, and it's now available for everyone to pick up and run with. And really, that's what I came here to say. Thank you, David. Um, we appreciate your skill in adding the stories to all those numbers. So our final speaker for this session is Freya Freya Silverage. Freya is a content manager for the Long COVID support website, and she's been a Long COVID advocate since 2020. Freya's talking today about long COVID support, Aotearoa. Kia ora everyone, thank you to everyone who is here. Um, I studied law at Otago University and it was the highlight of my life, so it's very special to now be speaking in an event hosted by Otago University. Um, I'll start by giving a bit of background to my long COVID journey. So I was working as a journalist in the Netherlands when I caught COVID in March 2020. It was a mild illness, as we were told it would be for young people. From the onset, my illness had a strong neurological impact. Fevers, dizziness, raging brain pulsations, memory decline, and a total loss of smell and taste were my most troubling symptoms. Next slide, please. I suffered from long COVID for the following eight months, which manifested in the form of relapses. And I'm just going to read an excerpt of something I wrote during this time. Four months have passed and I'm on to my fifth relapse. The room is eerily still, yet my mind spins like the stripes of a barber's pole. My brain pulsates and every vessel twists. Something is scraping the wrinkles in my brain, as if a mini person is going at it with a rake. The diarrhea begins, followed by my chest tightness and back pain. I dart between shivering and overheating. Different parts of my body are sporadically going numb. It was without a doubt the most harrowing time of my life. But during this time, I began my long COVID advocacy. I founded the New Zealand Long COVID Facebook group, did countless media interviews and published articles documenting mine and others' experiences. At month eight, my symptoms abated. I stopped relapsing and considered myself mostly recovered after I completed a three hour hike without any repercussions. 
I was ecstatic. Most of the people I connected with in 2020 are still unwell to this day, and thousands more have joined the cohort in subsequent COVID waves. Most long COVID patients go to their individual doctors and are spread across different specialists as they try and seek answers for their illness. They're often met with ignorance as most professionals have never heard of long COVID, let alone know any of the latest research on the disease. At worst, they're gaslit and told their symptoms are caused by anxiety. We are now three years into this pandemic and there are thousands of biomedical studies showing blood clots and vascular damage organ damage, viral persistence and T-cell dysfunction, myocarditis and loss of the brain's gray matter in patients with long COVID. We still don't understand the totality of these effects, but one obvious impact is in the workforce. Next slide, please. Um, many people suffering from long COVID cannot work, but even those who can often need accommodations and flexibility for their disability. Um, as Mona touched on, because New Zealand was relatively COVID free for two years, we have a delayed effect in seeing the impact, um, but we need only look to other countries to see how it's playing out. And this figure here is from the UK Office for National Statistics, and it shows that between July 2021 and 2022 July, claims for the disability benefit doubled. Now, we can't conclusively say this is down to COVID and long COVID without further investigation, but it is clear health problems are on the rise. Let me next slide, please. Another recent analysis published only last month by New York's largest compensation insurer showed that long COVID is unequivocally damaging the workforce. It found that 31% of all claimants suffered from long COVID. 40% of these returned to work within 60 days of infection, but received ongoing medical treatment for COVID-19 complications. 18% of the claimants had still not returned to work one year after being infected, and more than three quarters of them were under 60 years old. Perfect. Yeah. Now this graph provides an overview of everything that's happening with long COVID in Aotearoa. So we've got support groups dotted across different social media channels, various entities carrying out funded projects and other community initiatives um, and university programs studying COVID's impact. Now the Long COVID Support website aims to bring all this information together in one place. So instead of people trawling the internet for answers, they can simply go to the web page, which will give them all the latest information. So content on the website will include <coughs> help guides about the various long COVID symptoms and how to manage them, support links and resources, there'll be a donations page, a section for GPs on how best to manage a patient with long COVID, and tools for managing COVID and long COVID in the workplace. A key feature of the site is that it is by patients for patients. So we know long COVID affects everybody differently. So having a website that um, involves advice from people with a lived experience cannot be overstated. All of the articles and advice will be fact-checked by a medical professional. Next slide, perfect. Um, the site has also evolved into a registry which we housed on the website. Um, and I'm told, I think Paula Logelli will be speaking more on this later, but essentially this is a way for people to register their long COVID um, status. And this will give us insight into the prevalence of the disease. We know from content creation on the website that long COVID affects almost every single sufferer's ability to work. Some can't work at all. Others need a reduced workload and others can work full time, but this means a trade off with other activities such as socializing and their hobbies. What we do know is that everyone's work is extremely important to them, both from a financial and identity point of view, and no one willingly wants to work less or stop altogether. Now, I'm just going to read a quote from 28-year-old Sophie Harrison, and she's been suffering long COVID since March 2020. I felt like I was in free fall, desperately reaching for something to slow my descent, but with my hands grasping at thin air. One by one, I say goodbye to the pieces of my old life, coursework, exercise, time with friends, my ability to live independently. 
until all that was left was spending almost all day and night horizontal, occasionally sitting up for food or drink or standing to walk to the bathroom. It's hard to appreciate how much energy breathing takes until you've experienced the bone deep fatigue that makes you acutely aware of the effort to expand your rib cage for each breath. We know COVID isn't going anywhere and long COVID will continue to drag more unsuspecting people into the world of disability. The Long COVID Support Aotearoa website will be a place where we will continually collect information and aim to inform policy and patients. This will be a vital source of education and support as we learn to live with COVID and employees have to manage the long-term implications of COVID in the workplace. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Freya. And thanks for sharing your, your journey with us and really for all the work that you do to support so many people. So this brings to a close our session one presentations. Um, our speakers are now going to remain online um, and be part of our panel discussion. So I'm going to hand over now to Rob, our session facilitator, who I believe has collated some questions for them. Thank you. <clears throat> We've uh... I would encourage people to ask questions. Do feel free to uh, uh, to post anything that you that you really want clarification about. Um, I think there was a one of the questions which we started to answer is how do will how do the panelists feel that policies relating to long COVID, which you've been calling for, will spill over into uh, similar policies, possibly for ME and chronic fatigue syndrome. So I'll just throw that open to the entire panel. <clears throat> I'm happy to try and address that. Um, just acknowledging that I come with a, a bias because I do have ME myself. Really pushing for that to happen. And thank you for, um, I think it was Melissa who, who uh, was the first person who put that question out. It's a really important area. ME research, as you know, has been uh, terribly underfunded and we are doing our best to align the research that is ongoing. Uh, there are very specific um, attributes of long COVID that don't necessarily appear in ME, but likewise, it goes the other way too. But the impacts on people's lives are really remarkably similar. And I think actually, although long COVID has got a huge amount of attention using that phrase, um, mainly driven by the, the vast number of people who got long COVID in such a short period of time, I think actually we need to start rethinking this and thinking about um, post-viral illness as a kind of catch-all term to make sure that the ME community is brought along with the progress that's being made with long COVID and not sidelined as has happened for many decades in the past. This is a question that didn't come up in, in the Q&A per se, but um, I note that that Haley that the... Uh, the important thing was that the government agencies need to respond to the, the burgeoning need for support for people with long COVID. If if we are to be an agent for change, which I hope we are, um, what change would the panelists like to see? And perhaps I'll ask Haley to start off with that. Where would you like to see governments, the government, this government, responding to uh, the needs of, of people with long COVID? Oh, thank you, Rob. That's a great question. And uh, I think I'd, I'd like to say that there's a list. There's not just one or two small changes that need to be made. It is a change that is needed in every sphere. And so whether that's Ministry of Health, whether that is the uh, Ministry of, of Education, whether it's MBAE, um, for workplace policy, I think um, in every sphere we need to recognise that COVID and long COVID um, are not going to be going away. Um, we, we still anticipate that there will be future waves which will be affecting our workforce. And so I think the change that is needed is absolutely at that, at that governance level. But then I think there are, uh, as evidenced by our speakers today, um, there will be changes that we can make in our own spheres um, that can influence that wider change. I hope that's helpful. Great, thank you. Do other panelists want to comment? Um, just, just a quick thing. Yeah, Haley covered a lot. Brilliant. Um, I just, for, for me personally, there's so much that needs to be done on a practical level with long COVID. But ultimately, I mean, we need a 
far greater awareness. I mean, people need to understand the risks of infection and not just one infection, how often, you know, your chances of long COVID increase with each subsequent infection. Um, we need to do a huge amount of yeah, marketing to combat the COVID as mild rhetoric. Um, so people are more informed. I'd just like to add to that, that there's a lot of rhetoric at present with, you know, COVID is over, we've done the infection, people are still thinking of it as a single infection. Um, and that is something that there is going, it's going to be increasingly hard to deny that it is going to be an ongoing thing over the next little while. Well, I'd just like to add to that. Sorry. Go ahead. I was just going to say, I'd just like to, to add to that, that unfortunately the Ministry of Health is towing that line as well. We were told very recently that because the long COVID clinics in the UK are uh, shutting down, long COVID isn't a thing. They are shutting down because they were set up so badly they are not accessible, uh, rather than the need having disappeared. So I think that it's really important for all of those who are, of all of us who are working in the area, for, in whatever sphere, that we keep the momentum up, we keep the pressure on, and that uh, people in ministries of all sorts, as, as Hayley said, are uh, kept, everyone knows that, uh, that we've got to keep at this because it's not going to get any better anytime soon. Oh, absolutely. Um, those are two questions in the Q&A. One of them is, uh, what role does, do the unions play? And we're actually going to hear from, the, uh, from ASMS uh, about that uh, later this morning. And the website link to Long COVID uh, Support Group Aotearoa, the, the website's not actually up, up and running as yet, but we will send out that link to all registrants as soon as it's, uh, as it's up and running and Freya lets us know. A comment, sorry, this is a question for David. What sort of intervention would make the most difference to reduce the infection rate? Would things okay. like reducing days in the office by a couple of days be effective? Well, I mean, it depends on how many people you are seeing on the other days is more or less what it boils down to. Um, contact with others for a while inside the more different people you meet under those conditions for a while, the, the more risk of infection. Everything on top of that is mitigations and redu redu reductions to the risk. So getting fresh air in to change the year, big reduction in risk, um, huge reduction in risk. Um, protective gear, helpful in, for short-term contacts, absolutely. Um, yeah, the longer, basically, the longer contacts go on, the bigger the risk. Um, and basically, the longer contact, the, the more contacts and the longer they go on with in stale internal ear, the bigger the risk. That's the, the fundamental thing that everything is um, focused around and all the mitigations. Thank you very much. Well, we'll have to wrap session one up now. Uh, we'll take a brief break. Uh, just for you to get a cup of coffee to sustain yourself. Uh, and we'll come back at 10.30. Thanks to everybody in session one. Thank you. Thank you.